so grateful that you're here with us today. I'm uh, in a little series that the Lord has put on my heart, and today we're going to call the message The Father's Love. And uh, I pray that you've been blessed by this series, just talking about our calling and what is our calling, what's our purpose, you know, how do we, how do, we do this thing called the kingdom of God. The calling of God is connected with his unrelenting love. You can't separate them. We're called because of the love of God. We're sustained because of the love of God. And we are to live in that love. And man, that's a challenge sometimes because of the obstacles that we face and because of the things that we go through. But God says, listen, no matter what's going on around us, I want you to understand and know the Father's love. It's got to get out of our heads and into our hearts. See, we know that simple truth, God is love, but man, we got to move it out of, our, out of our heads and into our hearts, and we're to live in that. We're not to start out in God's love and then end up doing everything out of duty and obligation. When I'm talking to everybody about going to the serve tent and doing that, you don't want to go out there and do that just because there's a need. You want to do that because God's calling you and making room for you to get activated in his love. We want to do it out of love and not out of obligation, you know? And anytime we're doing things out of duty and obligation, then it's not flowing out of that Father's love that he has for us. We're to live in that love. How many of you read the book of Jude this week? Anybody? <laughs> you need to read the book of Jude, man. 25, one page, 25 verses. Go with me to Jude chapter 1 and verse number 1. I'm reading to you out of the New King James Bible, and I pray that Whatever translation you're reading out of that, you'll be able to follow along and take notes, all right? Jude chapter 1, verse number 1. This letter is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to you all who are called to live in the love of God. Man, listen now. We are all called to live in the love of God and in the care of Jesus Christ. This is... This is this message that Jude is writing, he's talking to the church and he's saying, listen, I want you to understand you're called to live in the love of God and in the care of Jesus Christ. This is the key, living in the love of God because of the care of Jesus Christ. And sometimes it, it's so easy to get off track just a little bit and start seeing yourself different than the Father sees you. Here's the thing. The relationship God created for you is this. You were created to be his son and daughter. He wasn't looking for servants. He wasn't looking for warriors. Come on, he wasn't looking, he wasn't looking for any of that. He said, I'm calling you to become a son or a daughter. You are called to be loved. And man, the enemy wants to put darkness in there and fear in there and hate in there and anger in there. And it's like, man, that's not who we're called to be. This kingdom that we live in is a kingdom of love. Yes, there are times when we have to take a stand and we have to stand up for what's right. And we gotta, we gotta fight the fight of faith. But let me tell you something, everything comes from a place of love, not a place of anger. Come on, you're not God's worker or God's soldier. You're not God's employee or God's spokesperson. Some of you see yourself as God's inmate on parole because of choices and decisions that you made, because you really messed things up. So now you're on parole, and God's just watching you to see if you're going to do right this time. That's not the right relationship. That's not the way God wants you to see yourself. It doesn't matter how you've messed up. It doesn't matter what you've been through, what you have done in your past, or what you didn't do in your past. When you come to Jesus Christ, he accepts you as a son or a daughter, and he loves you unconditionally. Your purpose in life is to be loved by God. You're looking for purpose? You're looking for what's my purpose and what's my calling? Your calling is this. It's, it's God's invitation for me to live out his plan for my life. But your purpose is to be loved by God. And if we can move that from our head to our heart and we can function in our day-to-day -day life knowing that God loves us and he's got a good plan, he's got a good ending to our story. 
So often we can look at where we're at and say, man, this is messed up. This isn't right. There's so many things that are not where they need to be. God says, don't worry about it. I've got the story written. I've got redemption wrote into your story. And though you're not experiencing my love the way I want you to, and though you made choices and decisions to maybe live out something that I didn't plan for you, in the end, I'm going to get you, man. I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to keep tracking you down until you surrender to my love. You will never be ineffective and you will never be effective in living out your plan for his, living out his plan for your life until you get the understanding and awareness of God's unwavering love. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Man, think about that. What love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we become the children of God. The Amplified Bible says this, what an incredible quality of the love of the Father has shown to us that we should be named and called and counted the children of God. We're sons and daughters first. We're sons and daughters. And that's who we are. The qualities and the expanse of God's love cannot be measured in our minds. You can't even comprehend it. You can't even fathom the depths of God's love for you. You can pray every week, seek God, come to church every week. You can even go to seminary and get a biblical degree, but you're still not going to totally understand the depths of God's love. You can hang out with God for decades and be a 20-year Christian or a 30-year Christian and still not be able to understand the depth of God's love for you and I. The Apostle Paul prayed this in Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Man, this is, the, this is the heart of the Father for us as children of God, as sons and daughters, that you can somehow grasp it and understand that even when you mess up, even at your worst day, even when things aren't going the way you thought they would, that the Heavenly Father is still looking at you with a smile and he's calling you to his love. I guess the best way to understand God's love is through parenting. I mean, through parenting, and I've got a picture. Most of you know um, my son, Jordan, and his wife, Amanda, just had a new baby, and that's baby Rowan, R-O-W-A-N. That's baby Rowan, and that's, my, that's a part of my family. I have another daughter, Destiny, and I have a, another daughter, Riley, but we have become this family. And in this parenting and in understanding me becoming a pastor, it's helping me to understand and comprehend what love is all about. We as parents have felt something. We know something about raising sons and daughters. There's a connection that can't be explained. It's a love that goes deep and it's unrelenting. But let me tell you something. In our best day of parental love, it's just a glimpse of the Father's love for us. In our best day of grandparenting, and I love being a grandparent. I love to send them home when I'm done with them. Say, okay, go. I love that. But in our best days of parenting and grandparenting, you, if you took that and times that times in, ex, infinity, you would just be getting a glimpse of the Father's love. I mean, it is so deep. It is uncompromising. And I'm just telling you, our, we have a tendency to relate to our heavenly father out of the filter of what we've had with our earthly father. And some of us, if we've experienced rejection or we went through divorce or we've seen, we've seen a, maybe a father that was drunk too much and was angry, and all of a sudden now we're relating to our heavenly father from that perspective or from that filter. And all of us need to be healed of that. Right? We need God's love to come in and overpower those feelings and say, even if you had a great dad and your dad was there for you and he loved God with all of his heart and he loved your mom with all of his heart and maybe he was a good dad, went to all your baseball games. I, I think that's amazing. But let me just tell you, his love, the father's love is so much greater than our love. And we've all got to get healed and we've all got to get restored from that. We need to be healed from that. We need a fresh view of the Father's love. 
The nature of your heavenly Father's love is unrelenting and unwavering. It keeps, it keeps coming at you on your worst day. It just keeps coming at you. He keeps loving you and looking down the road and waiting for that redemptive story to kick in. Jesus is preaching one day and he told a parable. And most of you know what a parable is. It, it, it's a story. It's a simple story that was used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. If you have your Bible, go with me to Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells the story in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. And you ever, like prodigal son, what does the word prodigal mean? It, it really means it, it's lavish. Like it means like wasted sometimes. It's wasted time and the prodigal son. And it, it tells of a wealthy father that had two sons. And the younger of the sons comes to the father and says, hey, I want what's mine. I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till the end. I want to get it now. Give me my portion. And he takes his portion. And the Bible says that he, he went to a far and a distant land, which means it took a while to get there. We didn't get there overnight. He, it took him a while. And in this land, he partied and he squandered all of his money. And he ended up broken and destitute. He ended up in a broken place. He runs out of money. He gets a job at a pig farm. And he's feeding pigs. And that's not a good job for a little Jewish boy. He's in, the, he's in a pig farm feeding pigs. And in Luke chapter 15 and verse 16, and he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine Eight, and no one gave him anything. In verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have, been, have, have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I'll rise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And in verse 20, and he arose, and he came to his father. But when he was still a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf in here and let's kill it and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And be they began to be merry. This is the heart of the father. This is a visual picture that we can get in our minds of how the father loves you and I. That he didn't give up on us when we weren't making the best decisions. And he didn't give up on us when we walked away and when we got hurt or we were offended. But he kept looking down the road, waiting for your appearance, waiting for you to come, waiting for you to turn that corner. And God says, I'm running towards you. I'm not waiting on you to get here. I'm running towards you. I want to show you the Father's love. This is the kind of church that we've got to be. We're here for the messed up people. Amen? We're here to be a table for broken people. We're here for the church and the unchurched. So often we think we're here for the church. We're here for the, the church people so we can come in and praise and get our praise on and worship God. But you've got to realize Destiny Church isn't just a church for the church. It's a church for the unchurched. It's not just a church for the people that keep all the rules. This is for the people that don't even know the rules. Come on. You got to remember that when you're walking into the building and there's a parking lot attendant who isn't looking at you smiling at you. It's like, who is this guy? He didn't even say hi or anything. You get to the greeters and the greeters are standing there and no one's smiling. They're just opening the door. They don't greet you. It's like, what in the world? Who are these people? And you get in here and there's an usher that's, that's mean and he's just kind of got a little angry attitude. He's like a little angry elf. He don't have the right spirit. You're like, who are these people? Let me just help you. This is the clientele of Destiny Church. This is who we're here for. This is what we're trying to do is bring people in who are broken and are hurting and help them to understand the Father's love so that they can operate out of wholeness and healing. Don't think just because everybody that's serving in here is all got it together. They don't have it together. I'm just telling you, some of the people that are serving here just had a horrible experience at home. And they walk through these doors and they're like, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to greet today.
Come on. We, we think everybody, oh, he's an usher, so he might be good to go out with. No, he may be a jerk. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Now, if it's part of our pastoral staff or our, 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 our staff, we may have some issues if you're experiencing that. But I, hopefully it's not any of our team, our staff. But let me just tell you something. We're here for broken people. And we love them. We're not categorizing them and saying, oh, you got it all together, now you can greet. No, you come in here, we want to just get you doing something for God. We want to let you know you've got purpose, you've got value, and we're going to love you right through your bad days, love you through your good days. Come on, there's a lot of people here who are a work in progress. And there's a lot of people here who are a piece of work. I don't know which one you are, but you do. <laughs> all you at home are laughing. You need to get here too. We, we like all of you too. Just remember, we're here to get broken people healthy. Huh? We don't write people off because of their brokenness. You don't know how many people I've prayed with at this altar that were just reeking from alcohol. I'm serious. They're just reeking. They're, you can just smell it in their skin, and they're like, I'm, I'm broken. I need Jesus. Well, that's why we're here. That's why we want you here, because there's healing here. There's health here. You can come as you are. You just can't stay that way. Come on. You can come as you are. You just can't stay that way. Why? Because the love of God, the love of God changes us. It transforms us. It renews us. It opens us to wholeness and healing. The love God is what we're here for. Come on, somebody. You got to get this into your spirit. We don't write people off because of their brokenness. That's what the world does. The world likes to categorize sin. Well, their sin is so great. Well, let me just tell you something. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's none righteous, not even one. We all have issues that God needs to deal with. And it's the love of God that changes us. The Father never stops looking down the road and he's waiting for the broken to return. It doesn't matter how far, how long you've been away. I was growing up with my little brother, Gary, who was uh, just a young kid. I was probably maybe, I, I was probably 16. I was 15 years, I know, I know what, what I was gonna say is this. I was 15 years old, my mom said, hey, we need, we need people at work and they'll work you after school if you wanna go to work. I went to work. I was like, okay, I went to school. I had to be at school at eight o'clock and then I got out of school at three o'clock and then I ran home and jumped in the car with my mom and we drove to this, uh, her workplace and I had a job and I worked till 11 o'clock at night and I was saving money. At 15 years old, I saved enough money that when I turned 16 years old, I bought my own car, my own brand new car. I didn't even have a driver's license, and I bought a brand new Mustang. I had a brand new Mustang. And the day that I got my driver's license, I, was, I, I went out of school, we went to the driver's license bureau, I got my license, and I went straight to work. I went to work, and my mom and dad drove my new Mustang to our workplace so that I could drive it home that night. And let me just tell you something. I was doing all of that, but in my heart, my little brother was doing bad. He's like 12 years old, man, hanging out with the wrong people. He's drinking all the time. He's partying. He would come home, and, 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 and then when mom and dad would go to sleep, he would get up and leave and stay out all night long. But my mother demonstrated the father's love. She kept loving him. And I was a little bit like the other son. Like, Mom, why, are you keep, why do you keep blessing him when he isn't living right? Why do you keep enabling him and, and, and you keep helping him? And, and every time we'd get in a situation, Gary would say, Mom, can I have some money? I, I need to get something to eat. And my mom would reach in here. I don't know why she kept it in there. <laughs> She'd reach in there and pull 20 bucks out. I'm, and I now get so much. I know, Bill. I, that's just what I grew up with, man. I can't explain it. So some of you women know what I'm talking about, but I, I would be so mad. Like, why do you keep doing that? Why do you keep giving to him when look at him? 
See, I couldn't understand it till I became a parent myself. I'm not talking about enabling our kids, man, because there is a line where you gotta, you gotta stop giving them things, but you never stop loving them. And I couldn't understand my mom's heart until I had my own children. And then I understood a little more about what the father's love looks like. He never writes us off. And thank God for his redemptive plan in my brother's life. My brother is now preaching the gospel in San Diego, leading men to Christ, standing there, has his own deliverance ministry, getting people free. But how did that happen? It happened with an unconditional, unwavering love. And some of you know I've been with you and I've stood with you and I've watched as you have, you, have, you have continued to give to your children who have mistreated you and not done right, but you keep giving to them. And, and there's a part of me that wants to help protect you, but then I go, you know what, we gotta keep loving them. How are they gonna change if we don't love them? The greatest gift you can give your children is to let them know no matter what, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, I'm gonna love you and I will always love you. My love is unwavering and it is unrestricted. I love you. This is the kind of love the Father has for us. My mom kept bailing him out, bailing him out of jail. And I'd be so angry in my heart. But now I look at him, I said, man, that, that came out of the greatest love that we could ever imagine. And it comes from the love of a mother and the love of a father. When you've been given much, you forgive much. When you've been forgiven much, you forgive much. Amen? There are people out there who have been out of church for years because of hurts and offenses. And I'm here to tell you, the father standing at the door looking at you say, come on, come on. When I see that shadow, when I see that image of you coming around that corner, he's going to run to you. God's still looking down the road. Isaiah 49 in verse 15. Isaiah is writing. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See how I've inscribed on the palms of my hands? I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands? Man, think about that. The Father says, others may be able to forget you, but I will never forget you. In the Amplified, it says, the Lord answered, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Indeed, I have inscribed a picture of you on the palms of my hands. And that's powerful. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, the Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. This is the love of the Father. Romans 8, 35 to 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we were killed all the day, all the day long. We were counted as sheep for slaughter. Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who, what, loved us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the love that he wants you to experience. That's the love that he wants you and I to be sustained by. That's the kind of unconditional, unwavering love that God says, you know what? If you'll let me put this love in your heart, I'll transform the way your life looks. The kind of love that transforms our lives. Here's four things that, that occur. Um, these are four transitions, four transformations that occur when we live our lives aware of God's love. I'm going to give you four things, okay? The first one is this. When I... When I I'm aware of God's love in my life, I feel accepted rather than ashamed. This is important. You're going to feel accepted rather than being ashamed. Most of us live with areas of shame and guilt and regret in our life. Anybody else got any regret in your life? I mean, I've got regret. I wish I would have did this differently. I wish I would have said that differently. I wish I would have responded differently. One time when my, my son was uh, a young boy and he got in a lot of trouble, he was going to Gulf Coast University. He was in the wrong atmosphere. And uh, he got in some trouble. And he got arrested. And I was the pastor of this church. And Bobby and I had to go down to Fort Myers to, when, when, and bail him out of jail. And we paid the money, we sat out in our car and waited. And when my son walked out of into that parking lot, and when he saw mom and I, when he saw us sitting there, he put his head down and just began to weep. 
He couldn't even walk. And I ran to him, Jay, and I just grabbed him. I said, Jordan, it's all good, man. I love you. God's with you. God's love. We love you. It's unconditional love. There was no guilt and shame in that. And some of us have carried guilt and shame because we haven't realized and acknowledged the love of the Father. The love of the Father goes beyond our, our issues and our circumstances. He grabs us and he holds us. He says, you know what? I'm going to turn this around because I wrote the rest of your story and I got a good ending for you. Amen? Amen? Most of us hate rejection. If you have low self-esteem and you're always wondering what everybody else is thinking, you need to receive the love of the Father. It's in that acceptance of the Father that removes that feeling of insecurity, that feeling of guilt and shame. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where that peace comes from. Romans 8.33 and 34, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. Every one of us need a fresh revelation of this, that we're accepted in him. As a kid and as a pastor, I've always dealt with insecurity. You think I'm up here preaching that I have so much confidence, but I'm telling you, I have wrestled with insecurity my whole life. But I've learned in, in receiving the Father's love for me, Gary, that it's, it's, it, it's everything's based. And, and now I've gotten to the place where there are only two opinions that matter. There are only two things, thoughts. One is God and the other is my wife. You know what I mean? When I know the Father loves me, I, w I want you guys to love me. But the more that I fall in love with God, the more I realize I don't care if you love me or not. <laughs> That sounds crazy, but it's just the truth. When you begin to walk in the Father's love and you know that he has accepted you, no matter what, even if I say something stupid from the pulpit, I don't get, I don't get do overs. I don't get retakes. Like I stand up here and I speak out of my spirit, and there are times where I walk out and I go home and think, man, what was I thinking? Like, why did I say that? There are times when she looks at me, she gets fidgety on the front row. She'll do, <laughs> like, she does her hand like that, and that means stop. Okay, I got it. You know? But when I know the Father loves me, that he, I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to say everything just right. They got a little thing at the house now whenever we're doing something. Be careful what you say. It'll be in pop sermon. <laughs> careful, you'll be in pop sermon. I got mugs that say it. Watch what you say. It'll be in one of his sermons. I got, they buy me shirts. I want you to love me, but as long as I know that he loves me, if you don't love me, just have a good lunch after church. I'm just, I'm good. And you need to get there too. You need to know God's love for you. Amen? Amen. When I live aware of God's love, number two, I'm bold in bringing my needs to God. This is important. Because when you know your heavenly father loves you, you can go boldly to his throne and ask. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14, 15, for as many are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of bondage unto fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. Romans 16, verse 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Listen, I don't know about your kids, but my kids don't come to me and say, oh, my most kind, gracious, heavenly father, after service, would you take us down to thy restaurant and buy us lunch? They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't say that. Huh? They don't say, oh, mighty provider of finances, would you help us with our rent this, year, this month? No. They come and say, dad, pop, I need money. I need help. Some of you, th we think we got to get everything just perfect so that we can go to the Father and ask him. And I'm just telling you, when you understand the Father's love, you have access to his throne room to go into his throne room and ask. And if you ask, he is faithful and just to meet your need and to supply everything you need. All his riches in Christ Jesus are yours through the asking. Come boldly to his throne room. 
Hebrews 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Number three, when you, when you understand that love of God, it, transform your, transform, it gives you a transformation in your life, and you have peace when it doesn't make sense. This is important. I have peace when life doesn't make sense. That's when the transformation occurs. It's, it's all of us go through times in our lives when we don't understand what's going on and why it's going on. You're going to get there. If you haven't gotten there yet as teenagers, I'm telling you, as young adults, you're going to come into a place where things are just going in a direction. You say, and you're going to ask the questions, where are you at, God? Why? Why? Why is this happening to me? I want you to remember this. Not everything in our lives is good, and not everything in our lives is God. This helps you when you're going through hard times that you can't understand. Philippians 4, 6 says this, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind through Jesus Christ. When it doesn't make sense, when things don't add up, when you're basking in the love of God, you know it's beyond my understanding but God is gonna work it out for good. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose. Number four, Miss Gail, if you could come to the keyboard. When I live aware of God's love, I gain courage to take risks. You will gain courage to take risk. Listen, when you, when you live in the love of God, you will be transformed from a person of fear to a person of faith. You're gonna be transformed from a person of doubt to a person of belief. In 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. I just wonder how every one of us would live our lives if you knew you couldn't fail. What would you do differently if you knew you couldn't fail? How would you live your life if you knew that you were following God and he was going to lead you? Because this is the heart of the Father. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. I'll counsel you. You know what he says? He says, if you fall, I'll pick you up. If you get sick, I'll heal you. Why? Because God goes before me. God's behind me. God's all around me. And it doesn't matter what I go through. It doesn't matter what I experience. If I know the love of the Father, I can get through it. And you can get through it. If you're seeking him, he'll direct your path. God's relentless love is most clearly expressed in the cross. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were utterly helpless, the loving Father showed up, put us on his shoulder. So come on, I'm take you home. Yeah, you made some bad decisions. And yeah, you've, you, you've been down a path I didn't want you to go, but I'm going to put you on my shoulders and I'm going to bring you home. John 15 and verse 13, I close with this. Everybody stand up on your feet. John 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his own life for his friends. Jesus displayed his love on the cross. God's called you and I to be his sons and his daughters. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you right now. Holy Spirit, I ask you to come. There's, there's layers of hurt, God. There's layers of hardness. There are so many lies that have tormented your people. And I ask Holy Spirit to remove those layers Peel back that heart, Lord, that needs to be softened. And let your love transform lives this morning. 
if everybody would kind of get a concept in your mind that possibly sitting right behind you. I wonder what you do, George. This is my father-in-law. He's a great man of God, knows the word through and through. I call him and ask him where scriptures are. He's been a preacher. He's been a pastor. What if right behind you, Papa, was a man that you knew was going to die and go to hell if he didn't give his life to the Lord right now? How would it impact our lives to think, Bill, you're an evangelist. You travel all over the country. But what if, and I know Alyssa loves the Lord and she's a great warrior, but what if Alyssa was standing two feet away from you and did not know Jesus? And that God was going to call. In the first service today, I, 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 I prayed with a young girl named Rachel. She's 15. She's part of our church body here. She was best friends with the 15-year-old girl that just got killed. And I said, Rachel, are you doing okay? She grabbed me and just crying and said, that was my best friend. She was my best friend. I want everybody to pray like the person right beside you or behind you doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want you to pray that God would speak to their heart and they would get the boldness to come out of their seat and come stand before this congregation and stand before God and say, God, here I am. I'm broken. Here I am. I need Jesus. I want you to pray like the person right around you is that person. The Bible tells us that tomorrow is promised to no man. It's appointed unto every man wants to die and then the judgment. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But I speak to your heart right now and I say, man, you're a son. You're a daughter. Your heavenly father wants to hold you. He wants to bring healing to your heart. He wants to, he wants to wash you and cleanse you and just let you know that he's provided an ending to your story that's good. And the devil's marked you with lies and decisions and bad choices. And, and God says, you know what, today, why don't you just give me your life again? Why don't you just trust me with your future? If you were to die today, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And I'm going to speak to my Christian kids right now. I'm going to speak to the Christian teenagers in here that love God, but you're not living right. You're not living right. You think you got lots of time. And you can't, you can't, you can't live this, this fake life with God where you just show up and worship God because you got good Christian friends, but your, your heart is hardened. And sin's got a hold of your life. You can't control your flesh. You can't control your heart. And God says, you know what? You gotta give it to me. Give it to me. I'll, I'll wash you, I'll cleanse you. I'll renew your mind. All over the house, from the front to the back, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about your condition with him, your spiritual condition with him, you're not where you need to be with God, and you know it. On the count of three, just lift those hands boldly to the Lord and say, God, I stand before you in honesty. I need you. I need you. I need healing. I need wholeness. Come on, if you're a broken man or woman in this room and you need God's love to be poured on you in a special way, I want you to respond by lifting your hands to the Lord and let, let the Holy Spirit minister to you right now. One, two, three. Just lift your hands. All